Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the CME Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Assessment and Treatment of Children with Complex ADHD. If you are in the wrong place, I suggest you just stick around anyway because we have a great presentation for you tonight. I'm Alexis Musto with Community Care Physicians. I'm gonna take care of just a few housekeeping items before Matt Hickling joins us to present on this topic. So some of you have already heard this if you were on a few minutes early, but we're gonna keep this relatively interactive. We're gonna ask all of you to answer a few questions throughout the presentation, and we're going to conduct these polls right through the WebEx chat. So all you have to do is keep your chat window open. Um, if you're on your computer, this can be found at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. If you're on the WebEx app on your phone, you typically have to click the three dots at the bottom to open that chat. Um, the questions will appear right in the chat when we release it. You'll select your answer before the timer runs out, and then we'll display the whole group's results. We're gonna leave about a minute to answer each question. Um, and don't worry if you get the questions wrong, no one is judging you, and no one will know that it's you. We also encourage you to ask questions. Um, we ask that you do keep yourself muted throughout the presentation to avoid any accidental interruptions. Um, but use the chat instead to submit your questions. I do see there are a few people on the phone. I'm not sure if you're also on your computer. If at the end you do have pressing questions and do want to try to unmute, you can uh, do that if you must. Sometimes because of the setting, you might not be able to, but you know we'll see how it goes. So just drop your questions in the chat to everyone and Matt and his team will address all your questions after the presentation. Um, feel free to write the questions as we go as well. We'll leave ample time at the end for all the Q&A. This is being recorded. You won't be on the recording, so don't worry. We'll make the slides and the recording available within about a week or so after this presentation. We have all of your email addresses, so we'll send you the links directly. But you can also check Developmental Pediatrics website or Facebook page for these links once available if you wish. Um, lastly, this is a CME, as you know, so we have certain requirements that we must follow. For those of you who are seeking CME credit, you should have already completed a pretest already that would have come from marketing at communitycare.com. If for some reason you didn't get it or you didn't have a chance to complete it already, that's fine. Go to the link, complete it as soon as you can. If you didn't get it, email marketing at communitycare.com. I'll drop that in the link after this. Um, that's also the place where the invitation, uh, what's on the invitation and where you would have RSVP'd. After the CME, we'll also email you your post test and the CME evaluation. So please complete that as soon as you can. The post test questions are the same as the pre test questions, and we'll cover those topics in this presentation. Once you complete the post test, we'll then email you your certificate of completion for the CME that you then will submit following the normal CME submission process you usually follow. Again, this is part of the CME requirement, so make sure you complete that post test in order to receive your uh, certificate. And again, don't worry, we will not grade you or judge you, just complete it so you can get the certificate. Um, okay, now on to the main event. I first wanna thank Capital Care Developmental Pediatrics of CCP and also CDPHP for hosting this event. It's my pleasure to introduce Matthew Hickling. He is our certified pediatric nurse practitioner and developmental specialist at Capital Care Developmental Pediatrics. He has extensive experience working in peds and advocating for those who don't understand their health and need help making healthy choices. As you read on the invitation for the event, he's very active in our community. He participates in a number of professional societies and nonprofits, so we're very excited to have him present tonight. With that, I'd like to pass it over to Matt to begin our presentation. Please remember, keep your chat open, um, your uh, microphone muted if you can, and thank you and welcome again. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Hickling. Um, I want to thank Alexis for that wonderful introduction. Um, for everyone else that is able to listen in, um, my name is Matt Hickling. Um, as you can see on this title slide here, um, tonight's presentation is in regards to the clinical practice guidelines uh, for the assessment and treatment of children with complex ADHD. Uh, you can see my face right now, uh, but what I'm actually going to do is hide my video so we'll be able to kind of, you know, not focus on me and slides at the same time. Uh, we'll be able to kind of have that, that luxury here. Uh, and again, I want to thank you all for being present, uh, especially with 90 degree plus weather. I feel it forced everyone inside. So if everyone is able to kind of be available here that I greatly appreciate you joining us. Um, I got to state that I have no financial disclosures um, or professional disclosures. 
um, as well as we're not really going to be discussing any non FDA approved drugs this evening. We're going to discuss options that are set forth uh, by the Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics uh, and algorithms that they have created for patients uh, in the complexities of ADHD. And the topic of medications that we know really could be a whole presentation itself. So after tonight's presentation, uh, we could take any feedback on whether this is something you want our team to present uh, as well in the future. Now, before we really jump into stuff in the discussion, I want to take a quick look at what you might find out there about ADHD and how it's discussed in today's uh, society. There's usually a lot of discussions and headlines right now about overdiagnosis, uh, comorbidities that are associated with ADHD, and even how the pandemic has increased the awareness from parents, teachers, providers, about attention difficulties and uh, what these are in the children and why it might be rising in the US. So quick fun fact, uh, and did you know that a lot of these celebrities actually are diagnosed with ADHD or other core comorbid factors that are associated with attention deficit challenges. Um, it's ironic to bring up Simone Biles because she has talked about this in the past uh, as a child who was diagnosed with ADHD and challenges that she went through especially in Rio in 2016, uh, when she was tested after all of her gold medals and they questioned her using methylphenidate uh, to even concerns right now when she was in Tokyo about how some of the twisties might be associated with the difficulties she did not have her meds with as well too, along with the mental health challenge. Um, people like Justin Timberlake, Adam Levine, uh, Justin Timberlake is known with obsessive compulsive disorder and ADHD, and other actors, actresses, athletes, astronauts, and other documented uh, celebrities and uh, famous people that may help maybe in conversations sometimes with your patients, uh, especially in pediatrics, um, to say, hey, other people who are diagnosed with these challenges and the superpowers and super abilities that they have along the way and what they have been successful with. Tonight's learning objectives are to review current comorbidities that are associated with the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD and to provide really a brief understanding of what treatment for the complex ADHD entails based off of those uh, Society for Developmental Behavioral Pediatric Algorithms and uh, guidelines uh, because it is very vast and complex. We're trying to give a, a brief outlook of how this may be helpful in some of the um, primary care patient management plans and integrating that knowledge into the diagnosis of these children with ADHD. So a part of that is going to be us going over a couple case studies as well, uh, based on the referrals to our practice and how it can be beneficial in your approach to management um, and what other resources or education are available to you as a provider and these families. So, for tonight's polls, uh, what Alexis was talking about at the start is we're going to try to keep this interactive. Uh, as a teacher at Siena for their nursing department, I like to kind of really engage people. And I know that it sometimes can be a challenge when you're sitting at home and you're kind of listening, or if you're just here really to grab a CME uh, and, and move on with your night. Uh, what I'm hoping for is to kind of have you take away a couple facts here or there. And one of the things we're going to be looking into is this polling option again on the right hand side with the chat. So after the Lexus is going to be starting it, it might have already started, um, you'll see that there are the most common comorbidities with ADHD. And I'd like you to take, it, take a guess. What do you think is the highest percentage? And that would be from choice one, anxiety disorder, choice two, autism, choice three, oppositional defiance disorder, choice four, learning disability, or choice five, tick disorders. Um, so if you look over in your chat, you'll see a polling option has come up uh, and you just choose one of those options. And we're going to kind of move on after that is um, you make a choice. We have about 20 seconds. So once the poll questions are there. So we now look at the graph. Um, and before I move on to the next slide, you can see that there are certain percentages and numbers if you're still looking in the polling uh, and how uh, tonight's participants, we have anxiety disorder, it seems to be the favorite in options. 
um, oppositional defiant disorder seems to be the next choice. Uh, and then we have learning disability and tick disorders. Um, some were unable to, I think, answer. So um, out of your thoughts uh, and responses, anxiety disorder seems to be the highest. We're gonna move on to the next one, Alexis. When you look at this slide, I want you to kind of gather where that big circle is on the outside first. And you'll see that the big blue circle shows that ADHD alone represented in kids being diagnosed is about 31%. Um, but inside this bubble, you can see that the more, the biggest one is oppositional defiant disorder in about 40%. There is anxiety disorder close by, but it generally ranges from about 15 to 35%. Um, this was from a study that was more in the early uh, 2020, so I'm sure without the, the pandemic and other factors, there probably could be a, a reevaluation, and I'm sure we'd see an increase, especially in today's world. Uh, you note other things like tick disorders being 11%, mood being 4%, conduct disorder being 14%. Autism, in other regards too, when you're looking at stuff, has about 25%, uh, but if you're looking at it as a diagnosis from our end, if we have a primary focus on autism, um, about 50% of those kids will have associated ADHD um, behaviors and challenges as well too. So the big part again, oppositional defiance disorder um, is the biggest comorbidity factor you can see with challenges and oppositional behaviors in kids with ADHD. We also got to make note that there are many factors that can influence ADHD development and the strong heritable components and environmental factors that can exacerbate and propel its course. Uh, you look at inherited genetic vulnerabilities, biological mediated risks, um, and then you look at certain things like family history, trauma, blood exposure, premature birth weight, maternal substance use, maternal pregnancy and illness, parenting stress, race, uh, African-Americans uh, being diagnosed greater than white children, uh, socioeconomics, and even challenges and changes in the prefrontal cortex and subcortical brain. You may be aware that in 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics updated their clinical practice guidelines for the diagnosis and evaluation and treatment of ADHD disorders in children and adolescents. Um, Soon to follow in 2020, the Society for Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics Clinical Practice uh, released their guidelines for the assessment and treatment of children with adolescents and complex ADHD disorders. That is a big part of what we're looking at tonight is saying how the American Academy of Pediatrics provides these baseline ADHD guidelines. However, complex cases tend to need more than this. And this is the time where patients are then referred to the pediatric or mental health specialists. But looking at those breakdowns in the AAP, you can see that the population diagnosis is generally a focus uh, in their report. So it's all children in ages four to 14 presenting in that primary care setting, generally for the first time with academic or behavioral problems and those symptoms of showing of inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity, meeting those criteria on, you know, um, diagnostic um, observations and um, gathering of information. And you look at now the Society for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics guideline and how this complements the AAP guiding the professionals managing care for children and adolescents with the complex ADHD. So I'm gonna have you be interactive again. And this is now kind of specific and might've been close to a question, hint, hint, you might've seen in your um, pre-tests. Uh, what complicates the evaluation and treatments for a patient to be considered complex ADHD? Um, you can see they present early uh, before four or late after 12, having coexisting conditions such as medical, psychiatric, developmental, and learning. They might have moderate to severe impact of symptoms on daily functioning. Uh, or they also might have been in a primary care setting with you as a provider, and you're uncertain about that ADHD diagnosis that you may have already provided them. Or last, uh, all the above.
for seconds. Looks like we're generating the poll. And majority chose all the above. So moving on to the next slide, you'll be able to see, and some chose moderate to severe impairments. Um, you look at how the answer is all the above. Complex ADHD is really when these children and adolescents have one or more coexisting conditions as we're describing and trying to pinpoint and complicates overall the evaluation and treatment management for their ADHD. So based off the guidelines, their goal is to focus on how some of these ADHD components and other comorbid factors can develop and be present before the age of four and even have a presentation after 12. And also what complicates maybe that easy diagnosis of an ADHD and what other variables can come into it. Looking at co-occurring conditions with developmental and learning issues, uh, other coexisting medical diagnoses or even psychiatric diagnoses. A big teaching point that I usually talk about with most of my parents and families is how to self-evaluate in their settings of where they see it really is a moderate to severe functional impairment and how that plays into a big factor in school, home, recreational activities, uh, and where they find that it is um, you know, impairing them. And we're going to discuss functional impairments a little more in depth um, coming up. Uh, your diagnostic uncertainty, whether we feel that it is meeting those DSM-5 criteria, or there are some things that are challenges and we can't really pinpoint right away, or we maybe did make the diagnosis and commit it, but we're finding that there's an inadequate response to this treatment. You'll see that about 70% of children with ADHD will have at least one uh, coexisting condition. 16% of them will have two, and actually 18% of them will have three. In the current practice model put forth by SDBP, there's two big areas that they primarily focus on. And one is on functional impairment to improve long-term outcomes. And that is really looking at the impairments such as problems with completing tasks at home, participating in school, following rules in the communities, uh, even getting along with friends and how these children are at increased risk for not doing well these tasks into adulthood. They focus in the SDBP model of treatments for these children on functional impairments and helping them develop the strategies and improving the areas that can help in uh, changes in function over time uh, and looking into the next part of focusing primarily on the psychosocial treatment as a foundation for the treatment of complex ADHD. And you can see I put that in red because that is a big focus of their, uh, their guidelines um, and how these are really to address the impairments in an adolescent, um, again, focusing in school, peers, family members, and again, focused on the long-term outcomes. Other areas that help in the practice model uh, are shared decision-making with these patients and these families, uh, interprofessional care, looking at it from all those that are treating uh, the primary role in making decisions about their ADHD, looking into multimodal treatments or even evidence-based psychosocial interventions. And those interventions that are found by the SDBP to be effective uh, are really in treating the complex ADHD of parent training on behavioral management, teacher training on classroom behavior management, and peer interventions and skills training, primarily more in the older children. They hone in on some interventions that are not scientifically effective, um, that they recommend should not take place over those. Um, some that you may have found success with. So again, this is just per their guidelines. Um, you know, it may not impact your practice treatment, but you know, some practices have this. Um, the interventions that are not scientifically effective would look at play therapy or cognitive training, neurofeedback, and eye track training. Um, so I know that play therapy can be a, a big area, especially for the younger kids. But like I said, that primary focus on them is treatment. Um, is the psychosocial, and that's where the behavioral parenting training is a big factor for this versus some of their play therapy recommendations. And lastly, looking at the life course perspective uh, and monitoring for the support treatment is especially important in one of their key action statements of transitions in time and those in the life, um, transitioning into kindergarten, third grade when the academics increase, changes from elementary to middle school and middle school to high school, high school to college, and so forth and making sure that the appropriate care and support is provided 
to meeting these new demands and settings uh, and keeping those in mind. So we're gonna look at a couple cases uh, that have come into the office, like I said, that uh, were helpful for review um, that may give us some idea of the complexity uh, of where some things based off your referrals of how we are trying to evaluate and break down some of these challenges based off of the, the SDBP guidelines and what you may or may not see, uh, as well as some hope in maybe something you see in practice that you might have taken away from tonight and help in your normal guideline practice and training uh, into those settings as well too. So our first case is a male um, who I sometimes refer to as Tom, who's uh, three years and six months. Uh, his referral to us was for autism, but also behavior concerns. Um, and those are kind of what we get sometimes uh, is our referral pages. So as you see as a provider, uh, sometimes you're like, okay, uh, going into rule out autism and a behavior concern. Uh, when you sit down with this family, you find that he was born at 35 weeks gestation. Uh, there is in utero cocaine exposure. There is several psychotropic medications used during pregnancy. Um, the guardian is unsure of alcohol and other illicit drugs uh, and showed signs of drug withdrawal a few weeks after birth. Um, they were discharged directly into foster care for the first four months. And then after that time, they were living with an aunt uh, but at 12, they were then placed with the grandmother. Um, and after that, grandmother recently had him, she had him evaluated by early intervention. He led to speech therapy around a year old and then transitioned into the committee on preschool special education where he was immediately placed into special education uh, with speech therapy and other services. Uh, he's continued with speech therapy and his 12 month programming. Uh, since that time, there's been ongoing delays in language skills, but there have been improvements where he's now speaking in three to five word sentences and pointing to wants and needs. He enjoys playing with the cars, the puzzles, the blocks, but he's not really engaging in imaginative play and avoiding playing with others and some improvements uh, again since starting school. Behaviorally, you'll see that there's high activity level and increased impulsiveness. Uh, it's led to safety concerns in the setting where he's eloped, uh, he's you know hit other kids, he's uh, been yelling and screaming at times where they're trying to move him and transition to him uh, and even challenges with emotional regulation. Now on to the next one, Alexis. The goals then for us being referred was for a specialist approach. And we're looking at certain things like determining that DSM-5 criteria and have they been met? Uh, determining if this preschool age child is really demonstrating inadequate responses to prior behavioral and educational treatments, identifying if there are major symptoms and impairments in more than two settings, and possibly even ruling out any alternative causes for symptom impairments, uh, you know, something like trauma that uh, seems to show in Tom's uh, history. We're gonna be looking at screening for any of those comorbid conditions, uh, the emotional, the behavioral, uh, in any developmental conditions of autism, learning disorders, or language disorders. Um, we're gonna probably be trying to use some questionnaires, Vanderbilt's, Connor's rating scores. Um, you know, sometimes he's a little young, but if it was more of an anxiety-based question, we'd look for scared forms uh, and how we also can collect these from further educational recreational settings. Uh, other parts to add to this case is that even though we have the IEP, uh, the IEPs, as you know, when you see them, sometimes do have uh, enough information, but they can also be a little outdated um, or not even complete, like the, the CPSE one. Thankfully, this one was very, uh, closely done to the time I had been seeing this patient, um, but there was still other information that we felt we needed to verify uh, to can move forward. Some ideas though that might help in not having our approach, but you know, in your own practice guidelines uh, or practice model would really be having some toys uh, in your office if you already don't that might think of some free play uh, for certain age groups. Uh, you know, for us, we use blocks and we use some of the cars or toys that help interact with the kids and try to engage them. Uh, spending some observation time uh, during your uh, session, if you have that, uh, to be able to kind of observe while chatting with the parent or conversing with the child and even using some structure-led tasks. You know, again, these are just things that if you don't have them in your practice model already, some recommendations, uh, you might have your standard questions you ask when they come in for a certain age group and how you get responses from them uh, and see if there's any atypicalities to those but some of these may be helpful in saying, hey, you know, there might be an evaluation of some sort in your 
uh, you know, future where you might have some challenges uh, that we see with impairment. Um, so those are some things to look into. The functional impairments that I was describing and what we're looking at in per SDBP models are seeing where are these challenges in those areas of academics, early learning, uh, where you can see if there's underachievement and early learning achievement, uh, or any identifications or red flags that show up for those co-occurring learning disabilities. How is their social interactions with parent and child interaction problems, difficult peer relationships and other social issues, self-concepts, uh, so low self-esteem, uh, and activities that might be suboptimal with community participation uh, and having an increased risk for accidents such as injuries, uh, you know, if they're older, driving, uh, and so forth. When we're looking at Tom in exam now, considering those things of areas of, you know, functional impairments and some of those specialist approaches that we're looking into, we saw delays in multiple domains of development. Uh, you know, his free play, first, he was initially hesitant. He didn't want to come out from behind grandma, but, uh, you know, kind of getting on the ground and trying to entice him. He casually engaged with the toys uh, when I kind of stepped back and let him come to the table on his own. Uh, he was generally quiet. Uh, he tried to avoid eye contact most of the time, uh, but eventually he did demonstrate some functional play, but there really wasn't some complex imagination going on. And eventually after we got settled, he began to run, climb on the furniture and get a little more comfortable with being uh, hard to wrangle in for evaluation. I saw that his cognitive skills were ranged between about 18 to 21 months. So we're seeing some of these cognitive abilities be delayed. Uh, and even some of his motor skills being below age about 15 months. Uh, like I said, he was initially needing some comfort before he started using the single words and short phrases. Uh, there was a mix of words and jargon and when we really tried to entice him with me and grandmother, uh, frustration really set forth when he couldn't be understood. Um, and then at times he would be very diminished in his attention and behavior. Um, you know, he kind of would throw the block sometimes when I tried to push him to um, make something or he would even try to do it on his own. Uh, and not build the, the certain things I was trying to get him to follow along with. So transitioning him from one activity um, over to the next because he found that a car was his favorite thing and kept crashing this into other stuff. Uh, it was very loud during this time as well too. So my question to you, and this will come up in the area here and based off of this case is, you know, what do you think the diagnosis for this child might be um, on top of, you know, and this is more of an initial along with that. Um, do you think that he meets criteria for ADHD? Um, do you think he has anxiety? Do we think there's autism involved here? Um, disruptive or oppositional behavior? Or do we feel that the overall picture shows the, the multiple comorbidities and how those really impact a lot of things here for, for Tom? So that's my question to you in the poll that uh, I'd like you to take a look at. And Alexis, when this poll is done, um, just leave the slide up here, please. Looking at the poll results, if you can see, um, majority chose multiple comorbidities. Um, a few chose ADHD, some chose anxiety, and some did feel autism could be representation here. Um, and staying here, Alexis, uh, you see that a lot of these challenges that we're talking about, the multiple, multiple comorbidities, uh, can really impact something like we were describing earlier. Where is the hereditary part? Where is the biological? Uh, where is the environmental, the traumatic? and how those all associate into things. And this is where SDBP is really trying to show the complexity and where certain core psychosocial components in the behavioral modifications um, need to uh, really be instituted before there might be some other questions um, of where the, the child might need some interventions or care. And one of those big factors uh, for Tom here, and we can go into the next slide, Alexis, 
um, is trauma. And you all probably understand the ACEs part pretty well in practice if you have your ACEs components in areas of concern and how much this can overlap. And this was an initial presentation into our office. So we know that some of these situations, it's very difficult to make a diagnosis on one visit and how we need to gather more information along the way. Uh, in the long run for Tom here, we did diagnose him actually with a developmental language disorder. And I have behavior concerns in other areas such as fine motor delays, learning difficulty, um, attention deficit concentration or concerns. And that also might be something you see from our office. You'll see these patients receive symptoms. Um, that's not really an official diagnosis. Uh, some of these symptom management areas of what we're trying to hone in on. And in a couple slides, you'll see what the, the ideal from SDBP's goals are with that change. The kids with trauma, we really will see that a lot of them across a lifespan, about 12 to 36% of them are gonna have these ADHD and PTSD components. And that the ACEs um, is really difficult for them in that in the absence of a, a supportive nurturing relationship, it, it's a toxic stress. And this stress can disrupt or impair healthy brain development leading to impact in learning, behavior, health, and can have a negative impact on health and functioning. And you wanna think about the effects of toxic stress and how that can be helped attenuated by establishing that stable, secure, and, and developmentally enriching environment uh, with strong nurturing relationships. And again, those psychosocial factors of a working environment. So in this age group, the SDBP is looking at primarily preschool age children with three to six as having behavioral interventions as the first line of treatment and how these families should look for a therapist that focuses on behavioral parenting training. Uh, and like I said, again, those behavioral parenting trainings may be hard to find too nowadays. Uh, and you may be thinking that like, yeah, we're trying to refer. Um, and we're gonna talk about maybe some of those areas that are you know, options. Um, again, when you're thinking about some of these, these challenges, because if you aren't having the intervention success, that's where SDBP then says, well, did we try this? How do we lead into that? Um, some other things for Tom that might be helpful are looking at a project teach provider database uh, and how they might have some behavioral intervention challenges associated for his traumatic impacts or factors for grandma now to help him in any of his difficulties. Um, where we need to collect further information from school. Um, do we need to have some more daily reports? Do we need to make sure that there is an FBA in progress or behavior intervention plans? Um, how is he doing socially with any peer focused social skills and really those trauma focused interventions. But SDBP really then highlights when behavioral treatment is not available, this is where clinicians from any area that are managing this child must weigh the risks and benefits of starting medication versus the harm of delaying the treatment. And that's where they've created this lovely baseline algorithm on the next slide, Alexis. Um, and hopefully you can see it. If not, we're gonna be able to kind of pinpoint it. I'm gonna also have the link uh, attached where Maud, who's doing the chat, may be able to send out that as well too. Um, you may need to lean in, but I'm gonna try to highlight it. At the top, it talks about um, focusing on the preschool age child with inadequate responses to those behavior and educational treatments and how providing psychoeducation about the medical treatment of ADHD, getting those baseline uh, ADHD scales and assessment baseline functional statuses might be helpful. Uh, and if those are not working, you've got to look at step three, where it talks about does this child have a severe baseline impulsivity, aggression, oppositional behavior, irritability, or concerns um, about a mood or affect? And if not, and you know they have a diagnosis of ADHD or even challenges with um, you know those areas of complexity, do we feel that it's immediate uh, release methylphenidate is a good start? Or if you're going to yes in that question. Where is it considering the initiating treatment of an alpha agonist such as the clonidine or guanfazine? Um, and then they kind of guide you through where there's the reassessments, the responses, and um, potential side effects by assessing those types of things and other areas of management, monitoring, maintenance, and treatment, uh, and how to give you some baseline guide. And again, these guides and algorithms created by SDBP are for certain um, you know, areas of challenges um, through different aspects, autism, tics, um, disruptive mood disorders. There's a bunch of them, again, which we'll put into the, uh, the link here on the side. 
So this was a pretty complex patient who we discussed where there are areas of where further management and education might be needed from our end and to gather those. Um, so for us, after this patient came, my goal was to continue to further manage him and look at him in the next six months and to get information from school uh, by having some weekly report cards, by to be in contact with the school if they can provide me information through uh, emails or phone calls uh, every couple months once he's starting. Uh, and kind of figuring out a, a more, um, you know, collaborative group setting for, for managing Tom going forward. So that is the end of case one. Case two, we have a little older patient uh, who's Jacob and is an active seven-year-old and recently diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, he's one of those ones that we talk about who's referred to our office for ADHD and something more. The primary attempted methylphenidate 10 milligrams daily one, one month ago, uh, which mom claimed that was being administered about 8 a.m. daily. Um, it was limited appetite during the day. There was no difficulty with insomnia. Uh, mom notes that his impulsivity got worse. He was getting in trouble in school for meltdowns. He's yelled, he's fought, he's damaged classroom property. Um, mom states he'll come into her room in the night because he's worried there's a bad man in the house. Mom claims she stopped the meds two days ago uh, and there's been a decrease in his anger. For Jacob, we did a scared uh, for the anxiety and we also redid his Vanderbilt scores to see about reevaluating if that, you know, confirming the ADHD diagnosis and what areas may or may not need to be addressed. Uh, we found that the Vanderbilt was positive for hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Uh, the scared was positive for anxiety disorder, separation anxiety and social anxiety. We confirmed his prenatal history was negative for maternal illness, maternal substance use, and confirmed he has no pre perinatal difficulties. Uh, his overall development was normal and found that his academic achievement has been good until this academic year. So once again, things to consider that we're looking at or even maybe helpful for you is again, looking at the DSM-5 criteria documenting any systems and symptoms and impairments that you see in more than two major settings uh, you know and that again includes your office setting um, if you see that there are some challenges but um, most people will try to collect those Vanderbilts those other outside uh, references and um, you know informational sheets from anything that they can uh, speech therapists occupational therapists um, and kind of help in gathering those those areas ruling out any alternative causes or symptoms and impairments. And again, screening or looking for any comorbid conditions that might send up red flags in your setting from the emotional, developmental, or physical conditions. I'm using this as a repetition to remind us of those conversations with families in the functional impairments and how those are impacting these kids, especially again, based off SDBP guidelines. Um, I'll see that Maud's finding the link here and I'll let her know what it is. Uh, at the end of this as well, too. Um, but looking at those functional impairments of underachievements, social interactions, self-concepts, and activities. Um, so those are some big areas that need to really, again, be considered. Where is there a moderate to severe impairment along with a lot of those other pieces of the, the diagnoses um, and challenges here for comorbid factors? So we're going to have one more interactive question. Um, you know, what do you think is the comorbid diagnosis for this child, Jacob, at seven? We're doing that. I will look for the link here that I sent to Maud. I'll be posting in the chat. Yeah. So that link I just posted right now um, should have everything you need for the algorithms uh, of everyone. No polling will be closing shortly.
All right. Majority chose anxiety. Uh, some chose oppositional defiance, and uh, you know, based off of where you may be on phones or listening in, um, we have no answers. Um, so going forward with this onto the next slide, uh, majority of you have identified that yeah, there's a, a comorbid diagnosis here of anxiety, um, and as we kind of briefly discussed, 15 to 35 percent of kids with ADHD uh, have a coexisting anxiety disorder. You know, they can commonly present with those somatic complaints, you know, the headaches, the stomach aches, uh, and you may see a lot end up with obsessive compulsive behaviors. Generally, you'll see some crying, some irritability, anger that may be really misunderstood as that oppositional or defiance. Uh, and you can look at other examples of difficulty managing anxiety in kids, how it's difficult to separate from parents beyond a, a certain age expectation, how there is uh, reduced social engagement due to anxiety over social rejection, embarrassments, um, maybe not speaking or not playing with peers and not participating in class. There's specific fears that may result in the impairment in function. Um, you know, fears of dogs or bugs or even natural disasters. We've had children come in here that are very obsessed over the weather uh, and what that weather is going to be based off of some challenges and uh, what's led to us investigating uh, where those repetitive rigid challenges can be. Uh, and if this is a mild, uh, you know, autistic behavior versus a, a significant anxiety disorder. Um, so those are big areas here, showing some atypical behaviors of the obsessive compulsive, uh, unwilling to try new situations, uh, and even emotional and behavioral dysregulation. So you got to think in the sense now as a provider, what is often, uh, we want to know what's really affecting this ADHD and what's driving the bus, because that's going to be the first order is determine if these are driving, them, which one is really in, in charge. Um, you're wanting to treat the more prominent condition uh, to see if there's improvements. And for instance, if anxiety is treated, Maybe this child isn't consumed with anxiety and won't worry over all their other thoughts. Uh, but if they're not in a frenzy or worried, then we're going to want to think about the flip side of ADHD and that being the bigger factor. Uh, so again, like I was saying, SDBP has provided these wonderful algorithms for us to look through. Um, and they have this one for ADHD and coexisting anxiety. And how now if you have a child with ADHD and anxiety like Jacob, uh, for the next slide, Alexis, um, you'll see, is the anxiety more impairing than ADHD? So they're trying to help you identify that. And one of the ways we see that is by using, in our setting, uh, and I know that chat's going on about Vanderbilt's and Scared's, um, is using two of those. And those are two that we've seen, um, but also trying to identify that in the, the setting itself. Um, you know, if we see uh, a child is diagnosed with ADHD, and when I'm trying to engage them, uh, one of my ones with, you know, uh, academic learning, uh, I'm asking a child to read something, and if they have been very, you know, productive and following along with everything, and then we sit down and say, all right, I'd like you to read the story, and you see now the inability to want to focus on what's going on, or they start playing with the magnet tiles, and it appears like they're not really paying attention, is that because of, again, now the learning challenge of maybe not reading, and they're anxious about this situation, and is that more impairing than the other areas uh, of challenges with ADHD that have already been previously diagnosed and identified now? Uh, and this is where cognitive behavioral therapy is chose uh, as their you know, suggestion uh, in monitoring that response. Um, if not, then it says to go to one of their other algorithms for behavioral and educational treatments, um, which, you know, again, the link I provided can give you some guidance there. Then looking at this, um, you'll see multiple steps of how it is improved, uh, where functions may need to be challenged, such as uh, if you've done an initial cognitive behavioral therapy um, with this child and there wasn't much response, how much were the parents, again, involved in this? Um, and if that wasn't really a general concept, uh, maybe seeing what they might do. If on the next levels of where anxiety is not improving after parental involvement, you can go to that, Alexis, it's, it's helpful. You can see it both ways. Um, on the third and the base, uh, you want to initiate this eight week trial of possibly an SSRI. Um, and one of those ones that you would think about, um, you know, for them uh, is just where they recommend um, the management in participating here. Because if these kids aren't participating effectively in the cognitive behavioral therapy, or it's still considered causing moderate or again, significant impairments in the areas we've discussed, that's where you're going to look at things like uh, maybe a fluoxetine or a sertraline, how they recommend those.
So a lot of people are asking, I think, about community resources. And you you know, there are difficulties today. COVID has definitely increased a lot of these challenges. And teachers, uh, you know, want to help as well, too. The community wants to help. Um, sometimes we're looking at what other outside resources are going to benefit for the, the psychiatric or mental health component. Um, a lot of times I like to remind people to look into the county mental health clinic. But again, not for the child, because a lot of these areas of kids that we're seeing challenges with, we've got to focus on those behavioral parenting training. And that's where some of these county mental health clinics do thrive and have those opportunities uh, to reach out to parents more and help in some training. Again, there may be some wait lists based off these areas, but there are uh, you know, availabilities uh, if you hit the right uh, opportunity. Looking at non-for-profit organizations, um, Northern Rivers, BHSN, St. Catharines. Uh, again, may not take a child based under five, however, looking into areas of parent behavioral training and that core primary component of psychosocial. Using those school counseling services, if you can reach out to a school counselor and saying, what uh, challenges have been met? Uh, are you guys doing some social engagements? Uh, are there areas or people that you may know in the private sector uh, and how that might help link them to a private therapist outside of school? Um, you know, I'm gonna have a sheet here we'll post as other references for private therapists and kids with challenges with ADHD and where it might be helpful for parents when they go into this of saying, what homework am I getting from these people? Is there something that has been helpful for me to learn uh, in these areas of um, difficulty and what other checklists might be beneficial to them? The option for community care has blossomed over this last year. Um, and we can't thank them enough for having a, a really strong integrated behavioral health team that has been available. And if you are unable to have that kind of referral, we in community care do have that option. So if we're coming here to rule out something, uh, we have the ability to refer patients to that behavioral health team, uh, which is doing a, a lot of different uh, areas of uh, behavioral health. Again, parent training, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and trying to manage a, a lot of these difficulties. Um, and then again, I always remind providers to look into the, the project teach uh, opportunity. And for us, you know, filling out keeps forms uh, to help with families uh, going further. Um, we're going to have some strategies, some apps, um, some books, and some other things that are going to post uh, as resources along with this web page underneath uh, for opportunities to look at for families, anger, anxiety, um, and where these things may be beneficial to them is helpful uh, when you're suggesting things to them. Uh, because apps and uh, QR codes and a lot of podcasts are really what a lot of families are, can find some success and benefit from too, uh, based off of some physical manual uh, community resources. So, you know, I, highlighting a PCP approach when you're looking at these cognitive behavioral challenges and um, trying to break down the comorbidities, we're looking to say, you know, screen broadly for these coexisting conditions and any of those functional impairments and trying to really pinpoint where you see a mildness to this uh, versus where you see those moderate to severe challenges and trying to help parents or um, maybe realize some of those areas that you may see uh, that they're unwilling to say like, oh, my kid's just a boy or, you know, she's just, you know, a little, she's, she's a little crazy. Um, you know, how those areas might benefit, um, you know, making it more uh, visual for them. Uh, consider which one of those may benefit from a comprehensive assessment um, and if unable to, uh, you know, and you need, refer to us as a specialist uh, with uh, some of our appropriate training and expertise. And I want to pinpoint here that we have this opportunity as a hotline. Um, and if you haven't heard this, uh, it's something that we're trying to really make aware for the, the community of where you could call our office and a provider would be available because you're kind of on the cusp of maybe wanting to refer somebody but feel strong in your practice model saying, you know what, I don't see this person as meeting a criteria for ADHD or anxiety, but I've got, you know, this type of question. And instead of even getting that referral through to us and maybe waiting a couple months before school challenges come up, or you're getting breathed down the neck of saying, we need CPSE to have this, we need CSE to see that, uh, those areas, you can call us and we might be able to kind of use some of that guidance of some of these algorithms or some of those proponents that might be helpful in gathering further information uh, to take initiative in some areas before uh, families feel that, um, that difficulty of where they might be missing out on things for their children as well too. The last 
key initiatives and uh, areas that they talk about with the SCBP guideline is advocacy and future research. Uh, they focus on highlighting the need for uh, addressing many of these systemic barriers and delivering the optimum care for the, the complex ADHD patients. They know there's financial barriers in limiting the access to those that have expertise in the assessment and expertise in treatment, and even really having consistent communication between all the individuals that care for the child. Uh, we know it's hard. We know that there are challenges in our days, um, and there's a lot of time that we just cannot get to some of those conversations immediately uh, when we know that it might be helpful for some families to, to have that done um, as quick as possible. And we, we understand the delays, and they understand those delays too. They understand that the inadequate expertise sometimes from primary settings to begin that process, um, and they recognize that these complexities really can um, be challenging uh, and know that they require a referral. There's limited numbers of specialists available in this area uh, in coordinating those components. Uh, there's limited resources with the education system and to meet the needs of high quality complexity screenings, assessments, treatments, monitoring of complex ADHD. And lastly, that tendency for the healthcare systems to defer the financial treatment responsibility of ADHD and coexisting conditions to the education system, simply because most obvious impact is usually seen in the school setting. So we know that ADHD is this chronic condition. It's often associated with a coexisting condition and other factors that complicate the diagnostic and treatment process. Uh, these affected children and adolescents are really at an increased risk for serious adverse outcomes in childhood, and in part, their concerns are inadequately addressed sometimes in childhood. The guideline is to prove, provide recommendations for the key aspects of assessment and treatment of children and adolescents with complex ADHD and highlight these areas of advocacy to address problems and assess the recommended services uh, and areas of additional research that are needed for our gaps in the knowledge of these kids. So some of these references are gonna be posted. Uh, I have a couple more since I was, you know, my own ADHD of posting things at the end of stuff and uh, getting through things. Um, but I need to have special thanks put out there to uh, Don Garza Masks, who uh, is uh, another fellow uh, you know, nurse practitioner who really helped in advising me on a lot of these materials from uh, other presentations she has presented. Uh, Dr. Ledesma and the SCBP for the information and helping with some of the information on these slides as well too. Uh, and Dr. Anthony Malone, Dr. Chowdhury, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Larrabee and Maud um, Kay in our office for helping listen to me, discuss, edit, and go through a lot of these uh, difficulties here uh, of pre finding the way to put this presentation together. Um, so for that, um, right now, I'm going to put my video back on and kind of be available for questions and catch up on any of these things that Maude may have been handling on the side here. So this I will open up to if anyone is uh, willing to unmute and didn't feel their question was answered during the side, um, you can kind of pop on here and uh, we can chat. No one has any questions, then um, we'll clearly let Alexis finish up with some of her pieces as well, too. So, Matt, I know we have a few people who are just on the phone, so you might want to go through the questions that were um, in the chat yeah, uh, for anyone who didn't see it. Going back up to the top. Dr. Snackenberg talked about, do you think the school's environment are over-diagnosing oppositional defiant disorder? Uh, do I think the school's environments are over-diagnosing? Uh, I think that falls in line with a, a lot of concerns of where you're seeing the, the you know, the articles of people over-diagnosing ADHD as well too. Uh, I think that people may jump to a diagnosis and feel that pressure in some settings uh, based off of certain behaviors and challenges versus collecting information, sometimes describing that we, we need some more to the complexity of this, you know, take uh, my first patient there, uh, you know, if people just jump to the conclusion that his, um, you know, unwillingness to look at me or play uh, and re, you know, find himself hidden away from people, uh, you know, people might think about that as the autistic behaviors right away and then say he's got autism and then he's got ADHD on top of it. Um, we really need to take time in those areas and helping with, uh, you know, the oppositional factors, we know that certain challenges will present itself. But I also then think about referring to a strong mental health team on top of us 
identifying some of those oppositional behaviors. So if we see those challenges, we really would say, hey, this might be better suited in some of the social work psychologist areas here that may need to be further followed up on and managed because if you find that there are ongoing challenges with more opposition, um, then those would be the areas that would be more covertly related to those ADHD things that we find. So that's where we generally wanna look at that. Um, and schools definitely, as I think Dr. Malone responded here, have become more strict with children who act out and it does likely increase the numbers. Um, so, you know, schools are very strict and a lot of parents are being sent home uh, early on because of people being unable to manage children. Um, and that's, that's uh, you know, the parents are doing what they can and that's hard. Um, so I know that that's a big area as well too. Um, let's see, virtual learning this past year has caused some challenges in diagnosis as well as parents and students are saying they cannot focus. Um, absolutely, Dr. Mehta, um, um, that is a big one. Uh, when we come in and patients are coming through with the virtual, uh, that's where you got to look at those components of gathering enough information. Um, you know, even if the school's saying this, how does this kid do if we were in a recreational setting? You know, if he's done soccer, if he's done baseball, um, or if he's done other things that have been challenging in other areas, um, you know, how does that attribute to some big areas? And even when you see them in your setting, how is that if you're trying to have them in a structured 15 minute check, um, the amount of times they touch things, check things, run in out the doors and move all over the place. So uh, the virtual learning component has been a challenge, but also has heightened some parents to kind of bring it in for bringing awareness to that versus where they may get lost in a, a classroom of 20, 25 kids and not be seen until that third grade environment where they might finally start to say, whoa, this challenge with learning has been associated with this person not following through on some of his attention because he's just been sliding under the radar for a couple of years. Do you dual diagnose the parent? Can you treat the kid if parent is untreated? Uh, in our setting, uh, we wouldn't uh, because of being pediatric and out of my scope of practice uh, because of not being in a family practice setting for myself. Um, if you're a family provider, uh, I'd say that'd be something to look at in your components of where those um, family settings might be and how much uh, you know heritability it is with the genetic components. Um, so I'll answer that. What feedback should primary care give, get from the schools, response to behavioral intervention graphs? We usually get nothing. Trying to catch up on these side things, everybody, I apologize. Uh, plans to present a CMA course on talking with parents about autism and update them. What feedback should primary care get from the school's uh, response to behavior intervention graphs? Those would be helpful, Dr. Snackenberg, yes. Um, if you can get in touch with the schools, um, sometimes then I'll have this link as well also of a, a daily report card. Um, some areas that might be helpful for parents and primary care to just touch base with a, a teacher or even see if there has been any updated evaluations. Um, how are they doing on a daily basis? How many times have they been reprimanded, redirected? Um, are they finding that there's challenges in their learning areas? How are they dealing with their peers? If you can get a quick three to five minute update on some of those things, um, that might give you some information by then having a teacher fill out a Vanderbilt form uh, or a Connors rating scale or some other things that might demonstrate in their setting uh, a hard evidence of these um, challenges in uh, a setting and looking at how that reacts to a lot of other pieces. Um, you know, if they haven't done behavior intervention, this is a, a conversation I have with some schools that schools are very much on hard fact information. And sometimes they'll be like, why did this kid get an ADHD diagnosis? Um, or why did this kid get an anxiety diagnosis? Um, they want to have put forth uh, some energy and efficiency to that too. And then they also will tell you um, that there are challenges with um, you know, not being able to do accommodations based off that. And this again is based off district um, from conversation I've had uh, where they generally can have some accommodations that are put in place, but to further um, have the, the pieces in place, they sometimes ask about a medical diagnosis, uh, which again relates to that pressure. 
So trying to collect as much information as possible to really make that diagnosis appropriate and see some of these other challenges underneath that is, is essential uh, as you know, SDBP tries to guide us. It's the only tool in Healthbox. It's not the only tool, but it's something that we use, as Maude says, the report card can give you good info. Um, but in our office, uh, we use the Vanderbilt a lot because it is a quick initiative to see uh, a checklist of more of the, the characteristics of ADHD and how they pinpoint with oppositional behaviors, uh, mood conduct, anxiety, and some learning difficulties. So a lot of those proponents that you'll see as comorbid factors uh, and how they can kind of give us a, a brief insight. Does that mean that's the, the, the overall picture of this child? Absolutely not, because sometimes I see heightened inattentive kids with nothing with anxiety on the back of this page. Um, but when you see them in presentation, the showing is that this kid is more anxious and you look at the undertones of some other information collected from school settings of what they respond with or write in how it's more of an anxious behavior versus a, an inattentive behavior. So uh, that's a part of where you might need some of those areas of interaction in your practice model of saying, you know, how can I really engage this kid? Or the, asking the parents certain questions that might heighten their availability of like, is your kid the one going into a toy store that is impulsively is just grabbing this toy and uh, gets distracted by something, you know, in particular? Or is your child the one that when you're in the toy store is going up and down every aisle uh, and then makes their toy decision and then suddenly gets in the car and goes, oh no, uh, that's not the toy I wanted and wants to go back in and get something like that. So trying to gather some other areas of uh, information or questions can be helpful in just a simple engagement here or there for five to 10 minutes. Um, will these slides be emailed? Uh, they're gonna be posted, I think, and emailed um, versus uh, where they are. Alexis, you might be able to speak to that one quickly. Yeah, we are going to email the slides to everyone who attended, so keep an eye out for that, but we're also gonna post them on Developmental Peds' website, on CCP's website and social media, but we'll send you a direct link to the slides, to the recording, um, to the resources and all of that stuff, so you'll have all the links that you need. Yeah, and I said we'll post some of these resources. If you are looking for some other information too, um, magazine like Attitude, ADD Attitude magazine is a good one. Um, and there is a great YouTube channel uh, by a guy named the ADHD Dude. Um, and he's wonderful. He's a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and he has a wonderful channel that breaks down a lot of pieces with executive functioning uh, and those types of challenges as well. Um, for everyone can, can look at that um, and where ADHD components might be some more complexity and he's broken down some of these things based off SDBP. I just posted a link for his YouTube channel. Can you share a behavior package form tools we can use in office? Like, you are right on page with me, Dr. Snackenberg. Um, there is something that I'm trying to work on with areas that might be helpful for gathering of information. Um, so we're gonna have that proponent uh, hopefully coming up where you can say uh, where we can gather pieces like school forms, Vanderbilts, and kind of like, I think you were implying a checklist of ideas of what to collect. Uh, yes, I am already on par with trying to identify those things for you to make it very easy to help identify some of these comorbidities and if need be, share that information with us if you're calling on the hotline or referring over to us as well too. Any other questions? Do you have a template for ADHD consults? Uh, for when you're looking at, I guess, Dr. Matt, for what you're looking at for breaking down for a consult, like sending it to us or for outside type pieces, um, information that way. Consult in our office. Not a specific template that I can think of, um, but what we could do is try to work together with something. Um, that's what I'm trying to say for the note, um, if you're looking for that. I think Maude's on this one. I 
can't even see if Maud's typing anything. Sorry for all those that are watching me watch a chat. Um, waiting to see if that helps Dr. Meta. Perfect. And yes, there's some areas that we could help out if any of those things would be appropriate for adding into your pieces too. Uh, if you wanted to, to chat with me or Maud or Dr. Malone or anyone else here in the office too, Dr. Meta. So um, if you wanted to, we could have a, another um, conversation about that further. Any other questions based off guidelines, theories, uh, helps for that? Looks like things might be slowing down over there, Alexis. Okay, perfect. I think you caught everything. Um, so thank you, Matt, on behalf of everyone here and Maude for helping to field some of those questions in the chat. Um, again, we'll send you all of these documents. So you can reference them later um, in the email that we're going to send you again. It will have the post test, the CME evaluation that you have to complete. Then we'll email you the certificate. Um, we'll include a link to the pre test again, just in case you didn't get a chance to do it yet. Um, no big deal. I don't think <laughs> so. We'll take care of that for you. And then we'll also include uh, Matt and his team at developmental pediatrics information address, phone number, fax number, um, Matt's email. I'm sure I'm sure you have no problem with that just in case uh, you need to reach out with any questions. So um, we will put you all in touch with each other, get you the slides and we really thank you for attending. We will have future CMEs, so we'll keep you on our list of people to communicate with. Um, and I think that pretty much covers it. So thank you all for attending. Um, I hope you all have a great rainy evening. It's raining outside. It is. <laughs> Glad that the weather brought everyone inside then to be here. Thank yes. you, Alexis. Absolutely. Did you hear it raining up on the roof? No, I was so focused talking. I apologize, everyone. I'm sorry. Um, and thank you again for everyone who really came tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, I hope that this information was helpful. Uh, it was really to kind of, like I said, give a brief understanding of these guidelines and how we understand from our end, even too, and the developmental experts that the complexity is vast and really that there are some challenges in trying to understand these kids and that time sometimes does benefit us by collecting appropriate information and making sure these kids aren't overdiagnosed or missed in other components that are along with their their management care so thank you guys for really taking the time out tonight we're also open to um any ideas that you might have for things that you need from us for future presentations absolutely great i think perfect and I'll stay on for a couple minutes here. Yeah, if anyone wants to, while people are leaving, if anyone has any further questions or anything.